time in the business, 10 years, then another 10 years full time. Um, I, I've done a lot of different things, but I knew that there are a lot of arrogant home inspectors. There are a lot of very nice home inspectors, and there are a lot of home inspectors that um, know a lot more than me. So I want to respect that. Um, you can see that to be able to be, a, I'm a certified indoor environmentalist um, nationally. Hey, jo but Jocelyn, okay. no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Somebody, somebody made a comment about your audio being off, but I can hear you. Can, it, can, can other people hear Jocelyn okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, keep, keep, I'm sorry for the interruption. Keep going, Jocelyn. No, no problem. So um, anyway, all of these I've got to do, I had to do initially, and then I have to do constant refresher courses. I spent a lot of time, the school that I go to loves my um, checkbook. Um, in putting this program together, it's like, what do I tell home inspectors that some, some of which know a whole lot more than me, some of which have been in the business for 35 years, so they've got a lot of experience. So Hollis and I talked about it, and we put together, or put together the idea of busting rumors and myths. I would love it if you guys would um, have a little score sheet beside you and tell me if I told you any myths that you thought were true and that I was able to show you differently, just so I know whether or not this has an impact. Um, I'm going to go over a myths, rumors and myths that have to do with indoor environmental pollution, asbestos, lead mold, radon, drinking water, HVAC, ductwork, carpeting, and then a few I found out about home inspectors. Um, the ones, if we run short time, I'll just cut out the home inspector part since you know most of the myths about yourselves. Um, I will stop between each topic because while those questions are fresh on your mind, I would like for you to share them. Again, I do not have all the answers, so if you ask a question that I don't know the answer to, I will make a note of that, do my best to get the answer to you. Um, I will be showing you a slide at the end that will give you my email address. So I would love it if you have questions that I did not get to answer, shoot me the question. I put research time in my schedule every week just to help people get the answers that they don't know. So if I don't know the answers, I will find them for you. I have a great resource of um, people that can help me. So indoor environmental, myth. Indoor air is healthier than outdoor air. That's a biggie. EPA says no, 90% of, um, of Americans are spending their time indoors, which makes indoor air very important. And they don't mean indoor air at home. They mean, if you think about it, you sleep, you get up in the morning, which you, most of us sleep indoors. We get up, brush our teeth, comb our hair, go to work. Where are we right in, going to work? Either in a bus or a car, which means we're indoors again. We leave that, go to our office. Some people go to construction sites, but a lot of people office environments where we spend another eight, uh, eight nine, ten hours. Then we get back in our car and then we come home. This time of year, we're not going usually out to do anything except maybe walk the dog. So if you look at it, there really are a lot of people spending time indoors. And since 1990, the EPA has consistently ranked indoor air pollution as one of the top five environmental risks to public health. Um, the common indoor air pollutants that they're finding is fuel burning um, combustion appliances. That's a really good one. I had a friend of mine call and tell me, you know, we just shut up the, the house. I was feeling really good. Now I'm getting headaches. Could you come stop by, check out what's going on? They live in a little like cabin. It's really, really cute. Um, but I walked into the cabin and knew right away why she was getting headaches. We, they had propane, um, propane fireplaces. They're beautiful. But she didn't have enough exhaust for them. She needed to get more fresh air, get those exhausted out. A lot of people don't realize those little things that can really make you sick. Um, her first comment was, well, you have propane fireplaces too, but I, I also have cathedral ceilings in my house, So, and my husband's really good at HVAC, so we've got that fresh air coming in. Tobacco products, everybody should know now with all the commercialization that tobacco is not good for us, smoking in the house is not good for us, but I'm over 60. I will admit that I was a 70s child, I was very rebellious, so I did smoke, 
And I then as I got older, I continued to smoke. And guess where I smoked? I smoked in the house with my kids. So we have to worry about all the impacts that we've had from the destruction that we did during the times when we didn't know. I don't know. I was a part of that whole lobbying with um, Philip Morris that tobaccos aren't good. Tobacco is good for you. And of course, we found out that we're wrong. Um, building materials and furnishings, all the off-gassing that comes from them. Um, household chemicals, another friend lived up in Thermont, Maryland, asked me to stop by her house because she and her husband were having a dilemma. She um, was getting headaches every time she was doing dishes. And some of you have heard this story that have heard me before, but she was getting headaches every time she did dishes. And her husband didn't believe her. She, he just thought she wanted to get out of doing dishes. So he started doing dishes. She didn't have headaches, but she really wanted to prove to him there was a reason why. So I walked in the kitchen, asked to be Snoopy, looked at the cupboards, looked in the, under the cupboards. We're under the cupboards, and underneath their sink. I do this too. Um, we're all guilty of the hoarding thing when we don't have time to clean up. She had thrown... Um, her Dawn dish liquid in there, her scrubbing bubbles, her bleach, her um, paint strippers from when she had done some stripping in the kitchen, and then, of course, the leftover paint, and about 15 other chemicals in there. A lot of people think that when they close the lid to those chemicals that they're no longer getting vapors released, but that's not true. No matter how tight you close it, it releases a vapor. We could have done a lot of testing for her. But the common sense says that either one of those vapors she was sensitive to and her husband's not, and or it could have been when the, the, the combination of two or three or all of those vapors making a very unique toxin that her husband was not sensitive to, but she was, and that was causing her headaches. Lots and lots of indoor problems come from our HVAC units, um, improper maintenance or improper use. Everybody's starting to do, use more of the um, humidification devices, which if improperly used can also cause pollution. Even more so, it attracts our um, bugs and our um, pests to come in. It gives them a good environment to flourish, um, that excess moisture. Um, XX moisture is a pollutant, and then outdoor sources, and was bringing stuff in, um, the pesticides that we use to get on our feet and we track them in the house, um, radon, and then of course regular indoor pollution. All of those are our most common indoor air pollutions. When we do investigations for a um, client that maybe their employees are going to sue them because they say their insides making them sick, the number one thing that we find, 80% of them, are due to mold, so biological contaminants. Another myth, um, cooking disinfects our food and therefore is also a great disinfectant for our environment. Um, per the World Health Association, around 3 billion people cook using open fires, simple stoves fueled by kerosene, fueled by biomass and fueled by coal. Um, obviously, there we are polluting our environment with our cooking. Um, per the World Health Association, um, each year close to 4 million people die prematurely from illnesses attributable to household air pollution from inefficient cooking practices, polluting stoves, paired with the solid fuels and kerosene that we use. Um, again, World Health Association, indoor air pollution causes non-communicable diseases, so that you're not spreading them, but it still contributes to strokes, coronary, heart disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I'm going to, like, my th tongue's going to get caught here. Um, COPD, lung cancer, things like that. Um, close to half of the deaths due to pneumonia among children under five is caused by particulate matter. Um, which is caused by soot. Um, for those of you who love burning candles in your house, not a really good indoor air thing if um, you don't have the house properly ventilated, fresh air coming in. So um, it gets inhaled, gets inhaled into our lungs. It's great what happened in the 70s. Um, again, 70s and 80s, we went through this whole energy thing. We started to become very, very efficient. We wanted to make our houses really tight. They did a great job of it. And five, ten years into that, they learned that the problem with, with making our – we don't have to change making our, ha airs, our, our houses tight, but the problem with making our houses tight is that we are now trapped – with that indoor air pollution. Um, we, we circulate it. Um, we are not, uh, we, we, we 
can't get away from it. So the idea is the one benefit that we can now do that we know we have to do is properly control the indoor environment and control the pollutants. And when we do find a pollutant, go after the source. Um, one of the seminars that I did for a bunch of realtors, they said, you know, you're, you're scaring us to death with all this indoor air thing, you know, that you're maybe you're just raising the flag too much. But in reality, our indoor environment and our health are directly related to each other. So it's very, very important to focus a little bit on indoor environment. We don't have to walk around fearful, but we should take some time out of our busy schedules to put some time into evaluating all of our indoor environments, making them healthy so that we don't have to think about them anymore, and then have regular checkups so that we can keep our environment healthy. Um, next myth, ozone generators. Now, I'm not talking about the high-powered industrial ozone generators that indoor environmentalists use to clean up the environment, like this one. I am talking about those new air filtration systems that come out and that advertise that they generate ozone and that helps um, control our indoor air pollution. So those ozone generators are effective in controlling indoor air pollution. False. Per the EPA, available scientific evidence shows that at concentrations that do not exceed public health standards, ozone has little potential to remove indoor air contaminants. Using the big powerful industrial ozones to clean up an indoor environmental, very, very, very good. But the little bit of concentrations, because they have that they have to go by EPA regulations and they can't put it out to high concentrations that could make a difference, they are not working the way that they originally thought that they would. The other thing is, is that they're finding people, especially people with COPD or that have lung um, diseases, are actually being impacted. Because they can't smell it, they don't know what's going on, but they notice that their um, lung challenge is being irritated. Some manufacturers suggest that ozone will render almost every chemical contaminant harmless by producing a chemical reaction whose only byproduct are carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water. That's very misleading. Scientific research shows that ozone generators are not effective at removing carbon monoxide or formaldehyde. Um, many of the chemicals, um, many, for many of the chemicals with the ozone does readily <clears throat> react, the reaction can only form a variety of harmful or irritating byproducts. For people who are very, very sensitive, just, just so you know, we have several different types of people when it comes to indoor environmental issues and how they react to it. Um, I tell the story all the time about my husband and I. My husband could go lay in a, sleep in a patch of poison ivy and never get poison ivy. If I, um, if my dog runs through poison ivy and gets downwind from me and the wind hits me, I'm going to have poison ivy from my head to my toes. Um, I'm going to be covered with it. That sensitivity, his sensitivity, not so great. My sensitivity, very high. It's the same way with indoor pollutants and indoor environmental issues. You will have people who can work in a moldy environment and never be impacted. People who can work around chemicals and never be impacted. You have another group of people that are hospitalized because of the reactions to their indoor environment and then you have everything in between. So that's something to understand when you're dealing with indoor environmental pollution. Um, for example, in a laboratory experiment that mixed ozone with chemicals from new carpet Ozone reduced many of these chemicals, including those which can produce that new carpet odor. Um, in the process, the reaction produced a variety of uh, I'm sorry, aldehydes, increased the total concentration of organic chemicals, increased the indoor concentrations of form formic acid, all of which irritate the lungs. So the odor went down, but other problem things rose. If used at concentrations that do not exceed the public health standards, ozone does not remove particles at all, including particles that cause most of the things that affect allergies. If used at concentrations to, that do not exceed public health standards, you'll notice I keep repeating that, that's very important, because when you start using the industrial ozone 
machines. I, I'll tell you about that real quick. So an industrial ozone machine is an, a, a machine that you will take it, just in case you don't know, I know some of you do know, take it into, let's say that we're trying to um, get mold growth to stop or there's a terrible cat urine odor that they can't seem to get rid of or that there's biologicals or something that we're trying to get rid of that ozone will work with. To get that to work, you have to totally close the um, contaminated area airtight, stick the ozone generator on, turn it on full blast and leave it run for 8 to 12 hours, never over 24 hours. I'll come back to that. That will kill everything. It, it, you have to remove all plants, all humans, all animals, all pets. It, you will go in there afterwards and have to clean up dead mice, cockroaches, because it kills everything in that room. Um, that's the ozones that the industrial people will use for um, indoor environmental issues. Um, if you go over that 24 hours, you can actually scorch the furniture, scorch the wood, scorch the stuff that was left there and leave a really, really nasty odor for a long time. Um, I had somebody who had to totally gut a house because they put it into the building for a week and never should have done that. Um, it does, when you use it, it the, that it doesn't exceed pu public health standards. It will not remove viruses, bacteria, mold. It will have an impact. It will help a little bit, but it's not going to help to the degree that people are purchasing, purchasing those for. Some scientific studies do support the claim that ozones effectively remove some odors. So we're right back to you have to run it to see if it's going to remove that stinky odor you're trying to get rid of. Otherwise, you're going to have to look at a temporary industrial ozone level. Um, recommendations, if you really want to get rid of the things, instead of buying that ozone generator, work towards controlling controlling your methods of, you're controlling your indoor air pollution, which is, you know, going after the source. And eliminate the, the pollutants at their source. So if it's an odor that's caused by cat urine, then it's cleaning up the cat urine. If it's an odor that's caused by biologicals, getting rid of the biologicals. Um, increasing outdoor air ventilation is does a world of good for indoor environments. And a lot of people, I had this um, hospital that they rent medical offices and um, all the, their employees were going to, call in OSHA because everybody was getting headaches in the afternoon. Um, when I went in to do the interviews, the employees were, you know, I found out that when they opened that site, and they said it was beautiful, when they got in there, the offices were great, they loved their new environment, there was a total of four or five employees in there. When I went in, I interviewed 24 people. Uh, I knew right away without them having to spend a lot of money on testing that they um, probably were breathing each other's carbon dioxide, the, the metabolic, metabolic stop that, that's made from your, from your breathing. They were breathing each other's air. But we went on ahead and ran the 24-hour test so that because they had to rebu rebuck what OSHA was um, coming in on. And um, it was, sure, that, that was the problem. There was too much carbon dioxide in the air. Um, all they had to do was do change change a couple things um, in their HVAC unit to bring in more fresh air, and they actually had HVAC techs on staff that could do that, so it wasn't a huge expense at all. And then the other thing is using proven methods of air cleaning. And I will go back and say over and over and over and over again, um, clean, 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 to have a healthy indoor environment. We don't have to be pristine. I don't clean house. Oh, I don't clean. I don't clean house much at all. But I do. Um, Clean how I have somebody come in and clean every two weeks, and then we do the stuff in between. Cleanliness really is a great thing for indoor environment. Um, so if you have questions on that, go ahead and shoot those over to um, the moderator. The monitor um, myth: sick building syndrome is a hoax. Boy, I hear this one a lot. That's the only thing about sick building syndrome is all the crazy people are the ones um, putting it in there. First of all, don't confuse sick building syndrome with building-related illness. They are two totally different things. Sick building syndrome is pretty much a situation where the occupants are experiencing acute health issues, comfort, discomfort issues um, that can be linked to when they're in the building, but not a specific illness, and you can't figure out what the cause is. That is what sick building syndrome is. Building-related illnesses when you have symptoms that are diagnosable 
and that you can identify what the source is. Um, that is like when I said that 80% of the investigations turn out to be mold, that would be a building-related illness. Those people were sick, they were sick, it was a mold contamination sickness, and we were able to identify what the problem is. So, um, I'm going to hit, try to hit this quick, but the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, OSHA, um, they, per, they prefer that we don't say sick building syndrome, they prefer we use the word indoor air quality. 20% of the workforce right now have symptoms. Watering eyes, coarseness, headaches, dry itchy skin, dizziness, nausea, heart palpitations, miscarriages, um, shortness of breath, nosebleeds, chronic fatigue, mental fogginess, tremors, swelling um, of the legs or ankles, cancer. Um, the building may be labeled as a sick building, and these are the symptoms that they're, su they're suffering from. It's a telling factor as if the symptoms um, ease when the workers leave and go home or they go on vacation. That's when you know for sure there really is a problem with the indoor air quality. It's kind of like Lyme disease. If you go online and research Lyme disease, there are like 500 symptoms from Lyme disease. Most Lyme disease patients only have four or five of the 500 symptoms. It's the same way with um, um, building-related illnesses, sick building syndrome. You can have 500 different things, but where you really know is it sick building syndrome is do you feel relief when you leave the building? Um, in 1984, the um, WHO, the World Health Organization, reported that up to 30% of new and remodeled buildings worldwide could be su um, subject to excessive complaints related to indoor environments. Now, we're right back. How can that happen? It's a brand new building. Well, think about it. In a brand new building, just like I said, we're making them really tight now. While they were building it, they, didn't, they, they had the frame up, but they didn't have the walls up, and it's raining. Spores are hitting that, the mold starts to grow, and then it dies off, and they put the walls up, no mold issue until they have a humidity event, and then you start having mold issues. Um, also, uh, if they didn't have the HVAC designed right, uh, if, they, uh, if the contaminants were brought in by employees, now you have, uh, you're trapped with the contaminants in that building and can't get them out, so that's why 30% of the buildings um, will have a problem even though they're brand new. Plus you have the off-gassing of VOCs, which um, people are not paying attention to as well. So it's important to note, some sick building syndrome, illness may have not been contracted outside, uh, may have been contracted outside the building. So if you've got some pollution going on in the parking lot and employees are bringing it in, then they automatically think it's the building that's making them sick when it's really the parking lot. Um, the person that's reporting the sick building syndrome may have an acute sensitivity, and then we start to argue, is that their problem or the building's owner's problem? Because I think that we should both be taking responsibility if you, if, you have, if you have an acute sensitivity. The person that's reporting it may be experiencing job-related stress or dissatisfaction. So they come in every day to work. They're sick, they're calling it sick building syndrome, but really it's because they're sick of being at work. Um, and then, of course, we have the, all the psychosocial, the psychosocial factors that play into it, which is um, Emily's complaining all the time, that then Kendra starts to get the same disorder, and then Heather starts to get the same disorder. It's really all um, psychosocial, psychosomatic, and yes, some people will find out that their sick building syndrome is psychosomatic. However, I would argue that there definitely is a sick building syndrome thing going on out there. Causes the sick, sick building syndrome, typically when you, when you go to doing the investigation, you find out that it was inadequate ventilation, so one of the number one causes of sick building syndrome is not enough fresh air. Um, chemical contaminants from indoor sources, so the housekeeping's not storing stuff right, or um, chemicals were used during renovations and have contaminated the environment. Biological contaminants, which I just went over that with the whole thing, what happens when we're building houses and, you know, the mold's going to kind of lay dormant until it gets wet. Also, um, we have to really watch the humidity levels. To have a decent humidity in a building, it should average between 35 and 
um, those of you that sat in my seminar a couple months ago heard this, um, if you get it below 35, 40%, human bodies need moisture. So our skin will begin to crack, our lips will begin to crack, we'll get nosebleeds, we'll have dry eye syndrome, our lips will tap. Um, that's because we're not getting enough moisture, and part of the moisture we get is from our, our environment. However, when that moisture starts to go up and get to 50%, warning bells should go off. We should have an alarm. We don't have to do anything yet, but it's going to get dangerous. Hit 60%, and that is the perfect environment for mold growth. So those dead spores that were laying in the wall that rooted while the house was being built but then didn't do anything because it was dry, we have a humidity event in the building, so now they start to grow. And then it gets dry again, so they stop. And then we have another humidity, humidity event, so it grows again. Then it dries and it stops to grow, and then we have another humidity event. Well, you go on with multiple humidity events over a five-year period of time. The building was new five years ago. Today it's five years old, and we're starting to experience mold in the building. Well, that mold's always been there. It just doesn't become an unhealthy environment until the mold colonies reached a certain size and we're able to start influencing what was going on in the environment. So very important to control the humidity in our environment as well. So solutions to sick building syndrome, expensive testing is not always warranted. It's not, I really don't recommend it. Quite often, if you have a certified indoor environmentalist come in and take a walkthrough, they might see, just like I did with the person doing dishes and like the person with the fireplace and the office that had too many employees in it, sometimes you can identify it um, really, really easy. The reason that the... Um, owner of the building or the occupants aren't identifying it is because when you live with it every single day, you don't realize that it's coming upon you. And it's getting that fresh set of eyes in to look at it that can show you that, hey, you, this is the problem. We don't have to do testing. Let's just try this. And if that works, then you have the answer. Um, pollutant source removal, very, very important. If you can get to the source of the problem, um, or a modification that's, that they are really good, effective approaches to resolving the indoor air quality um, when the sources are known and the control is feasible. Um, but when the sources can't be known, then the only thing you can do is test. There are 10,000 tests you can run to fi figure out what an indoor problem is. My recommendation is to start with the most popular ones, which I hit a little bit earlier, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, ozone. Um, Humidity, there's like seven of them that you would want to test first because, again, outside of mold, they then have become the most popular problems of indoor environmental pollution. Increasing the ventilation, air distribution often can be a very cost of way of um, reducing indoor pollution levels. You know, you dilute it. Quite often, indoor air quality can be um, improved just by having your HVAC looked at. Um, the design could have been bad. I had a college in, in um, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, that they got entire dorm building was contaminated with mold, and it was all because the HVA system was brand new when they renovated, and it was it was it was too big for the building, so it was not running cycling right. They had to make quite a few adjustments, but once they got adjusted right and had two different mold remediation projects before they figured it out, um, but when they did figure it out, that is a beautiful building now. Duct cleanliness, um, we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but doing a duct cleanliness inspection, because quite often the source of the problem is in the duct work. So if you get the ducts, you don't, don't clean your ducts, but do an inspection to see if they need cleaned, quite often you can identify the source there as well. And the checking air filters, you don't know how many times that I've gone in and people just didn't think about it. They don't have it on their maintenance list to, to check their air filters regularly, so they're all clogged up with dirt. Um, I even had one place that when I went to check their air, their, um, air filters in their HVAC, they had not put any in um, or somebody forgot to put them in. So um, checking the HVAC unit and then checking air filters, not just in the ductwork, but if they have those little mini air filtration systems on their vacuum cleaners everywhere, air filters need to be cleaned regularly for them to work properly. And then confirm that the local exhaust ventilation is actually exhausting outside. Lots and lots, especially in the old houses, the bathrooms, they exhaust their bathroom humidity air, they exhaust it into the attic 
which all they're doing is pulling the moisture from their bathroom to the attic, then the attic becomes contaminated. So making sure that all of our ventilation is exhausted outside. And then uh, partic that's particularly true for restrooms, <coughs> copy rooms, and printing facilities. If you, um, another place where you get a lot of um, problems with indoor pollution um, in, a, in an office building, it's because they bought a bigger printer without realizing that they also need to be able to exhaust that printing room. A lot of pollution comes off of our printers. Air cleaning can be useful in conjunction with source control. That's those, those little air um, filtering systems. They really do work. There's all different types out there right now, so it's getting the one that best fits your indoor environment. But when you use that with getting rid of the source problems and taking care of the ventilation, um, it really, really helps. Um, air cleaning can be very useful, but it is not the full solution. It's just using it in conjunction with source control. So now's the time. You got questions, comments, if you've been sitting, um, sticking those in there. Um, who's my monitor? Is that you, Hollis? I or? got one for you, Jocelyn. It's Sean. How's it going? It's good, Sean. How are you? Very good, very good. It was great. Uh, I sat through your presentation two months ago, and it was fantastic. And this is fantastic, it, too. Um, in, Mar in Maryland or Pennsylvania? Yep. yep in Maryland. Maryland. Excellent. Yep. Okay, great. Now I have All a face right. name. Question. Yeah, exactly. I got a question for you. Is there a good and inexpensive DIY approach that can be used to eradicate mold? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I'm going to come up on that. I made my mold section very, very short because I understand you have a mold speaker coming in in the future. But if whoever asks that question shoots me an email, and I'm going to give you my email address at the end. I have put together, we have a lot of D. Um, um, do-it-yourselfers, um, when we do a proposal for somebody for mold remediation and say, can you do it yourself, I put together an extensive uh, mold remediation plan for an extensive situation. Then you take that and you um, can um, customize it to your mold problem. And if you feel comfortable with doing it yourself, go for it. Um, what I would recommend is post testing then that way you know that you um or with, with if it's not me it's somebody but post testing to be sure that you have your um spore levels low and in a healthy um way because if you don't do a good job it isn't necessary that oh man now i got to call an expert to come in no what you got to do is clean again you clean 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 till the mold remediation is done um i i have a really good program that I do educating on that. So I can send that slideshow to whoever's asking the question. It really is more than what I can go into here. Um, I'll, I'll give you the quick outline. I also have that extensive plan that I can send. So typically a mold remediation is one, absolutely positively must find the source of the moisture that caused the mold to begin with. If you do not do that, 12, 24 hours, 72 hours later, you will have to redo the entire mold remediation again because um, moisture is the number one key factor. You never can get rid of all the spores, so they're going to come back again. Mold's going to come back again if you don't get rid of the source problem, which is moisture. That's number one. So once you've, identified, you've done that, you've addressed it, you got rid of it, now you need to get rid, you need to go through. What are you going to keep and what are you going to throw away? So if this was a really, really mad, bad mold problem and you have antiques that you want to keep, you put them outside, you're going to need to restore them. Um, if you have anything porous like couches, baby dolls, toys, blankets, my recommendation is to pitch them because you will never get the roots out of this. Now I'm talking about an extensive mold remediation. So you go through, decide what you're going to clean, what you're not, anything you can get out. Throw away, put in the dumpster what you're going to throw away. The things that you're going to restore, you want to keep them outside, totally away from the environment that you're going to remediate. Um, I would also recommend um, if you've got to carry them from the mold contaminated environment through a clean environment to get them outside, wrap them first because all the spores will fly off of them into your clean environment. Then it's going and clean, clean. You got to, got to, any trim, anything that's moldy that you can throw out, I would. 
Um, and then anything that you can't, like your structural components, then you would clean it, um, scrub it down, get it, get it as clean as you possibly can, HEPA vacuum it, clean it again, HEPA vacuum it again, and, and then um, if you've got concrete walls, structural components, you can encapsulate them. You're not encapsulating them to make them look pretty, although it does look pretty when you're done, but you're doing it to suffocate any spores that you couldn't get out because it's really hard to get rid of all the spores. Running air scrubbers the whole time you're doing this, containing the area so you don't cross-contaminate, and then run post-remediation samples to be sure that the level of mold spores is now low. If you have not gotten it low enough, then you need to clean again, or you miss the colony, you need to investigate again. Does that answer the question well enough? I think so. Okay, people are gonna be afraid to ask questions because I give all these long-winded answers. No, it's fantastic, it's great information. All right, next question. Um, I got one for you. Why does it seem like a lot of the old-timer inspectors are extremely skeptical about the duct cleaning doing much? I am going to answer that for you here in a few minutes. And if it doesn't answer it, then ask me again, but I'm pretty sure I will help you with that question here very shortly. Perfect, um, that's it. Okay, Onward. all right, thank you. Move it. Sure thing, Sean, sure thing. All right, so I'm gonna hit asbestos next. Myth, asbestos is no longer a problem in the United States, false. July 12, 1989, the EPA issued a final rule and banned asbestos containing production in the United States. Then in 1991, the rule went back to the Fifth Circuit Court and they vacated the ruling. So there's nothing illegal about any asbestos in our country except for a limited four or five different things. So most of the original ban, manufacture, importation, processing, distribution, and commerce, um, uh, most asbestos-containing products are, are, that were covered was overturned in 89. Um, American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine reported in 2004, the issue that asbestos is still a hazard is true for 1.3 million U.S. workers in the construction industry, workers involved in the maintenance of buildings, workers involved in um, not, not that you know, you think the only people that are going to get hurt are the abatement people, but no, it's the workers that are still exposed to it. Today, over 3,000 consumer goods can be found at Lowe's and Home Depot sitting on the shelves. The thing is, is that now they don't say, um, look, buy our product because it contains asbestos, so it's great, it'll hold together well. Instead, they say it contains crocetile, and most people don't know what crocetile is. This includes caulking, joint compound, roofing shingles, drywall gaskets. Um, the big contractors that are involved in building the, the um, multiple housing project, uh, housing areas, the new developments, and the ones that build the um, shopping centers, they're buying in quantity. Quite often, I don't know if the trade wars will change this, but they're buying in quantity from China where there are no regulations. So most of the stuff coming from China, warning, 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 has asbestos. Any of the toys that are painted have lead-based paint. So please, please, please be cautious of what you buy your kids. So all of the systems that we use to build our house quite often still have asbestos in them. CNN report, um, my husband just sent to me this last week, November, 29, a mandatory evacuation ordered if after a series of explosions in a Texas chemical plant has been lifted. The county official said Friday, tens of thousands of re residents, this is all excerpts, within a four mile radius of this um, TPC group plant in a small city in Port, I can't say that, Nichols, has been told to leave their homes Wednesday after explosions at the site which led to fires. The fires are not extinguished, but they are contained, said Jefferson County judge who issued the evacuation order. Brannick said Friday that residents should be on the outlook for pieces of, of, of asbestos that might have been expelled um, in the explosion. So if you got asbestos in your yard, please call us. Could have blown the asbestos debris over the neighborhoods and into some people's yards. If it's white, chalky sus substance, said um, the report, the reported TPC, you should get in touch with us. And whatever you do, don't 
touch it because it's asbestos. So yes, it's still a problem in the United States. And asbestos inspection only needs to be performed on properties being demolished or renovated whose construction was prior to 1980. Huge mess because of what I just went over. Most states, um, most states, all properties being demolished or renovated have to have an ins inspection no matter when it was built. Why? Because we're still putting asbestos into our um, buildings. The asbestos spans were overturned. Another myth, the dangers of asbestos have been exaggerated by lawyers. I do believe that's like a half truth, um, that, but understand the dangers of asbestos are well documented, scientifically proved people do get sick from asbestos. Hundreds of studies back in to the 1930s have reported how asbestos leads to diseases in humans. You know, they knew it back in the 30s that asbestos was going to kill people. Most Next myth, most people do not even know what asbestos is or that it exists. Um, I think there's a little Canadian town that will disagree. The Canadian town named asbestos, which is where one of the first asbestos mines were ever set up, is trying to shed its toxic association and rebrand itself after city officials said the name linked to the most popular, once popular building insulation material has cost the city out, outside investments. The cube, um, Quebec town, population 7,000, announced on Wednesday that it will change its name because it does not have a good connotation. So they don't like the word asbestos, but they, you know, obviously a lot of people know about it and they're holding it against them. Next myth, only people who work directly with asbestos are at risk of for mesothelioma and other asbestos-related diseases. Understand, indirect contact with asbestos is as dangerous as handling it directly. If you know how you get asbestos, you inhale the fiber, it lodges in your lungs, you're either as asbestos um, in the lining is mesothelioma, you have asbestos, you have um, some cancers that are caused in the stomach, but it's because that fiber gets there, your immune system tries to attack it to get it out and it can't because those fibers are awesome. They will help our products last so long, but they also totally destroy the insides of our bodies. Um, asbestos fibers, when they're released, they can linger in the air for up to 72 hours or more. Um, so uh, if somebody you know, just hits the, a, a pipe in their basement um, and it, the dust flies, they're, they, they're in danger. Not to say that I'm not trying to scare people, they shouldn't go into a panic, but they need to clean it up with a HEPA vacuum cleaner and they need to do something about either um, getting it removed or containing it. Where we really run into problems is with those contractors that say, oh, don't call an asbestos abatement company, we'll do it for you over the weekend when nobody's looking and we'll do it for half the cost. Well, they don't. if they don't use containment, they contaminates themselves, their employees, the residents of that property, probably every room in that property because it gets sucked into HVAC and gets spread and maybe even in their neighbors because the way it lingers in the air when you open the door, the chimney effect is either taking it outside or pulling it in. People need to be aware, they need to be safe. Fibers can settle on clothing, hair, water supplies, food. Those fi fibers pose just as much a threat to human health as the products themselves. It's, the pro it's not the products that's dangerous. It's those doggone fibers. Myth, asbestos should be removed immediately if it's found. Now, that is not true. Asbestos is safe as long as it's intact. Where it becomes a hazard is when it be, when when the when it releases when you have a fiber release. So you see nine by nine tile, you pretty much can assume that it's probably asbestos tile. But if it's not releasing fibers, it's not dangerous. It's fine. Myth: I'll be fine if I wear a mask, one of those little dust masks that you get at um, Home Depot or Lowe's. Nothing again. I love Home Depot and Lowe's, but uh, I use them as an example often because I'm in there all the time. Um, but they, they are not fine. You need a respirator. You need containment so that you don't cross-contaminate rooms. You need to protect your, your, your employees um, and workers in the environment. You need to protect the occupants. So just putting on a mask and tearing out the, the, the um, asbestos is not going to do it. It's just not going to do it. Um, the EPA, per the EPA, um, abatement can only be performed by an asbestos abatement contractor unless you own and live, the pro live in the property where you're abating. So if it's in your house, you can 
and you own the house and you live in that house, you can't abate it. Um, I just remembered we're national. That's true in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and West Virginia. If you're in another state, just go to the um, your state websites because sometimes the EPA will say it's legal, but the truth is whichever law is the strictest. So if your state has stricter laws, you have to abide by them. Um, keep in mind, if you're a landlord, <coughs> you own rental properties, this does not apply to you. Um, you have to own the property and be living in the property. So you're not allowed to abate properties that you rent. So questions and answers, any on that, Sean? Um, we had some interest in Transite. Are you going to cover that in a... a I, I am not. What was okay. the question on Transite? Um, they, they would just be interested in any information that you have about Transite. Ask them to shoot me an email. I'll be happy. And I don't know, um, Sean Hollis, if you send me everybody's email, I can answer those questions and send out a mass email to everybody to whatever you guys want me to do. But Jocelyn, but, um, Jocelyn yeah. after after you're done here, maybe maybe you and I can chat tomorrow morning or something about um, uh, getting some of this information from you, and we can post it on the website, or I can send it out. I'll, or we'll, we'll, we'll talk I'll about give that you my tomorrow. Whole presentation. Yeah, that right. that would be good. Well, okay. And I talk about that tomorrow. Um, I think a question that keeps coming up about transite is, is you know, we find these transite ducts, you know, the sub slab ducts. Um, yes. And sometimes those, sometimes they fill with water. Well, I don't know how big of a deal that is in terms of, of indoor air quality. If it's just water that gets in there when it rains, and maybe that's good, maybe it's bad. But I've heard about um, people lining those transite ducts with some kind of a, I think, they, I think they spray on something. Are you familiar with that? I am. I am. Um, and it is a, not a bad idea. That's called encapsulating. It'll hold the fibers down. It'll hold your mold spores down. You want to make sure it's dry first, all that kind of stuff. That has, that has about a five-year life um, from what my research has shown. So um, it, it is a good temporary fix, uh, it, but you have to understand it is temporary. At some point in time, that spray will start to um, peel and crack. And then you can have a fiber release. You're also left under the um, impression that it's okay. You just need to calendar three to five years, start checking it. And then when it starts to peel, you got to make a decision about removal. Removal would be the better move. But I understand sometimes removal isn't an option. So the spray on is fine. Okay, Did thanks. that answer your question? I think so. Okay, sure. It looks like we got a comment here. Somebody saying that the duct armor has a 15-year guarantee. Are you? From, uh, there you go. Can you email me that? Whoever said that, please email me that, because I, I I can put that in my presentation. Duct, duct armor. Okay, we'll make sure we get that. Yeah. We'll make sure we get that yeah, today. Okay. Great. All right, carry on. Okay, cool. All right, lead. Myth: Lead poisoning isn't a problem anymore. Um, the doctors would disagree. Um, if you look at our housing, there's still 35% of the housing has lead-based paint in it. Um, of course, the newer it gets, the less. So your older houses, your um, urban city areas seem to have more, and your farmhouses seem to have more. But 35%. Lead is no longer added to paint and gas. That is wrong. Now, there is a law about that. They tell you how much you're allowed to add to it, and it always is below. Like if, I'm, if I were to do um, an XRF reading of paint that they call lead-free, it will say that it's lead-free because it's not um, the amount, but they're still putting little bits in there, and there's no safe um, um, amount of lead. They are doing a little bit in our gas, too but it's still going on there. Um, there's still small quantities of that lead is going in out of this both paint and gas, but it's now, it's not a lot. It's not, it's, it's, you have to live with it. Um, but understand there is no safe level of lead at all. Um, right back to good housekeeping practices. Anybody that has a house where the interior or the exterior, because we bring the dust in on our feet, that has lead-based paint in it, um, we need to keep it intact, but good housekeeping practices will protect your occupants, especially your children. So you know, that, that means really vacuuming regularly with the HEPA vacuum, damp wiping. We should never be sweeping, and there's no myth in there about that, but you should never sweep um, indoors because that just stirs stuff up. Um, 
old ad about, you know, they were trying to get people to buy lead-based paint. These walls don't look, don't just look great, but they're yummy too. That is true. Um, with, there's been reports lately that there's a couple of people out there arguing that, you know, that sweet taste is not lead. No, it's not lead, but it's the corrosiveness that lead causes, so it can be traced right back to lead. Paint, paint is sweet. But most children do not get, um, oh, only children who eat um, paint chimps will get lead poisoning. Absolutely false. Most people will be lead poisoned, most children will be lead poisoned by the dust. That peeling paint is the source, um, but most children, those tiny particles are falling in their toys, and what do children do? They put everything in their mouth, so, and they're crawling on that floor, they've got damp little hands, and what do they do with their hands? They put them in their house, they put them in their mouths, so that dust is what really poisons children. Only children get lead poisoning. Jack Webb, I met him about 10 years ago. He's become a really good friend, but he actually called me as a client. He had blood, um, lead in his blood levels when he went to, for his 70-year-old um, checkup. They were absolutely through the roof. His doctor was panicking. Where are you getting all this lead from? And he said, well, I am doing a little renovation project at my house. He said, call somebody to test. I went in there, and I didn't even have to run the XRF but five times. Every He had a pile of debris in the middle of his living room, tested those. They all had lead paint on them. Every building component had lead paint. And he was doing a full renovation with no containment, not even to keep the dust out of the kitchen. Um, I'm surprised his wife hadn't tested positive too. Um, it, was, it was a mess. Um, it took four cleanings to get that house to get the dust level where it could be um, um, occupied again. Um, he's become a really good friend because we spent so much time there and um, he's putting the word out to everybody. Please use safe work practices when renovating houses that have lead-based paint. Myth, only children with very high levels of lead in their blood are going to be harmed. Absolutely not. You talk to, I go to these home shows and um, have talked to PTAs and you hear the horror stories about children who are impacted. There's probably even people on this call. The long-term effects that they have from um, learning and behavior disorders, that's the ones that can be traced. Again, I'm over 60. So I know I have friends that obviously were impacted by lead. I can just tell by the way they act. Um, questions or comments on lead? Nope. Nope, nope. okay, cool. Mold, um, there are no mold regulations. Um, depending on where you're from, that is absolutely a false. Um, there have been mold remediation regulations established in Florida, Tennessee, Maryland, Mississippi, Texas, or Louisiana. The only ones I'm really familiar with are Maryland. They, they do have a set of regs, but they don't enforce them. Um, to do mold remediation, you have to have a impro home improvement license. And then they started to go into the other things, and they figured there was no way they would be able to control it. So the regulations are there, but they're not applying them. Um, Virginia needs added to this list. I'll make a note of that. Virginia has regs. If you are in Virginia and um, Florida, I understand the regs can be very, very strict. I'm not sure about the other states listed there. Um, Professional mold remediation companies though, will typically follow the guidelines set by the EPA and the mold in schools and commercial buildings. You can get that online or the ICRC 520, which you have to pretty much pay for. But um, the regulations are great. They do it protect occupants, employees, um, that you really do want to use a mold remediation company that uses one of these two sources as the way that they handle their mold protocol. Mold testing before abatement is absolutely critical. False. Um, if you can see the mold, smell the mold, the mold's really bad, that tells me you have mold. Why spend money testing? You would only want to test under the circumstances where you suspect mold and you can't find the colony or the source. Because right back then, we go to like the sick building syndrome. It could be psychosomatic. It could be that um, you, if you find out what the kind of mold it is, it helps you figure out where the mold colony is. You know, like stacky botrys will only grow when it's really, really wet. So then you can check the plumbing more or something like that. Um, when the type needs to be identified, you want to do testing. That's when you have a person who's sensitive to mold and you need to know, was it penicillium? Was it stachybotrys? So the doctor knows how to handle their, um, 
they're recovering from being contaminated. And then um, when you need to convince a complainant that there is no mold, that's a really, really good time to um, have testing done because then you have hard copy evidence of it. Um, if you see it remediated, there's no reason in these circumstances that would not be considered an extensive problem. That's probably, if it's only there, it's set up a little containment, take the drywall out. It's a small remediation problem, but still deal with it. Why test the air? It's sooner or later, if it's not contaminating the air, it will get worse and it will contaminate the air. Myth, bleach is perfect for mold remediation. No, 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 bleach will kill the mold. It will make the wood look nice and pretty again, but it leaves behind moisture. And what do mold spores and um, mold roots love? They love moisture. So when the chemical's done its job, you've got moisture behind it to help it start growing again. Myth, if there's no odor, there's no mold. Absolutely not true. Some Molds don't cause odors or the colony is so small it's not an odor or the colony is dead because moisture hasn't been around in a while so you don't smell it so there is no mold. However, I will tell you that mold is your big tell tall indicator that you have mold. Um, I think I told the Maryland or the PA group, my, uh, my mom, bless her heart, she's in her 80s and um, I just know that she has mold in her basement, but she says, no, 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 that's just the way my the way a basement's supposed to smell. Understand a basement is not supposed to smell. Um, it is your indoor environment and you should be um, keeping it mold free. Um, if you don't smell the mold, but you suspect there's a problem, check the most likely areas. And if you can't find the mold, then air samples, like I said, could help. Using mold killing products are the solution. No, they're only part of the solution. Um, mold killing chemicals, paints, filters, they all help, but mold will come back if you don't get rid of the moisture. The, the, it, it will come back because the moisture is what it loves the most. Um, if, you, if, if that were not true, then we wouldn't have mold in our refrigerators, you know? Um, it, so mold isn't totally controlled by nutrients or by um, temperature, it's also controlled by moisture. Myth, um, a house can be and should be completely free of mold. That is not going to happen. If I were to take a mold sample of my kitchen counter, your kitchen counter, and a doctor's office counter, they're all going to come back with some kind of mold. Just because mold, it's natural part of our environment. It's all around us all the time. Uh, but mold then becomes an issue when you have high concentrations of mold. That's what creates the unhealthy environment is when you have a high concentration environment. And remember, like I said, our, our buildings are airtight now. So the mold's not being diluted. It's, you know, it's, it, we're, we're, we're stuck inside with it. So controlling it becomes real important. Killing mold is enough. Absolutely not. The um, spores carry a mycotoxin. That mycotoxin is what really is making us sick. So it's the spores and the mycotoxins that are making us sick. Um, cleaning up mold is not hard. Anyone can do it themselves. Half-truth, properly cleaning mold contamination, identifying and addressing the cause, isolating the area to keep from cross-contamination, removing the infected areas, cleaning, 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 cleaning. Anybody can do that, but not everybody should do that. And having somebody that's, it's just like a carpenter. I mean, you can build a house yourself, but is it going to look right and be what you wanted? Um, if not, you're going to hire a skilled carpenter. Same way with mold remediation. Um, in the case of a severe, severe contamination, one should understand the setting up the containment, having the helper filtration units, using protective gear, using HEPA filters, using specialized cleaning agents all become really important. And then no matter who does the mold remediation, and a lot of mold remediation companies do it without post remediation air samples, they really, really shouldn't because you never, you cannot do a visual. A, a mold colony can be as small as the end of your pinky and contaminate an environment. So it's important to test the environment to make sure that you're confirming that it's, it's clean. A physician can do blood work to determine if the patient has been exposed to mold. Half true, 
They can do the blood work. It can tell them that they have a mold contamination, but it will never tell them where they got the mold contamination. So when somebody says they're going to sue you because your building contaminated them, they got to prove it because there's mold is everywhere all the time. It might be at home. It might be in their car. It might be at their babysitters. And that could be what's made them sick, not your, your um, environment. Myth, mold in a basement or crawl space will not affect the occupants in the occupied area of the property. Not true. Approximately 50% of the air in our basement crawl spaces migrate to the main living area. So it's important to keep those as clean as we possibly can, um, keep them um, um, mold free. Myth, if a basement is wet or damp, just stick a dehumidifier in it. Not true. Why? Because 50% of the air is going up there. A basement or crawl space is wet. A great contractor will do a full um, exterior and interior assessment to determine where the moisture is coming from. I see contractors day in, day out telling people we need to install a waterproofing system in your basement. And people spend twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to find out what they really needed was to get their gutters repaired or their landscaping fixed or get the plumbing fixed in their kitchen or the bathroom or get the roof leaked all the way down and getting that roof leak fixed. So when you have a wet basement or a crawl space doing a full exterior and interior assessment, which um, I have an ebook that I could send you where it tell, next month's chapter will tell you what the things are to check to do that assessment if you want to do it yourself. There's interior waterproofing, there's exterior waterproofing then. If the water is the problem and it's not the gutters, then you need to look at what is the best system for your property. Questions, I'm gonna skip questions on this, um, Sean. Okay. Um, radon, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna keep running through it till um, my time is over. Um, opening windows to lower the radon levels during radon, will we'll lower your radon levels, maybe. Opening windows can cause a chimney effect and will skew the um, radon results. So they could be higher or they could be lower. You, you, you don't know what opening the windows is going to do. That's because of the way the gases go into your measurement equipment. Um, Short-term testing um, is not enough to make a decision about taking action to fix the radon problem. I don't know about you, but if I do a short-term test and it says I have radon, there is no safe level of radon, radon I'm getting a radon mitigation system. Why spend money on a, a 30, 60, 90 day year program and live in the radon while you're doing it? Just fix it. Radon is only a problem in certain part of the country. Um, if you look, I think that everybody should have radon tests. One out of 15 people, homes in the United States are having radon issues. And Pennsylvania, Maryland, West Virginia is worse because we have a very high rate um, level of uranium in our ground. Radon is only a concern in homes. No, it's you're breathing it in your offices as well. So anywhere where you spend an, any amount, occupants spend an amount of time, you should have a radon test. So now I am going to skip drinking water and go to my most important question, my most important myth. I'm going to skip HVAC. Oh, um, people were asking about HVAC. Um, this is when you get your ductwork clean. When there's substantial visible mold growth, when you have infestation of vermin and when your ducts are clogged with excessive amounts of dust and debris. That's when you get them cleaned. If you clean them when they don't have these issues, you end up, you could actually end up contaminating it with more dust. And then last thing, last myth I'll hit you with. I hope this was good. Um, Myth, all home inspectors are good looking. Answer, I'm willing to give you my opinion. So I love giving my opinion. There is my email address. Please don't hesitate to use me as a resource. Send me your questions. Let me know if you like this program or not. I loved being here. Thank you all so very much. Back to you, Hollis. Well, thank you, Jocelyn. That was uh, a whirlwind of, um, of information there. And we I should... hope it wasn't too Fast. Sorry. No, 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 it's perfect. It was um, it was very clearly um, uh, articulated and, and well well um, well laid out. And I think that the fact that you you didn't get a lot of questions um, suggests that uh, you are very comprehensive. 
the um i had one straggler one straggler question if you if you want to do it real quick Go ahead. Does, uh, does covering paint does covering lead-based paint with another paint job does that is that considered a good remediation it is it's called intact um, and if you um, if you go to my website, which is www.baxtergroupinc.com, there's a, a place there where you can sign up for my ebook, and I think it's chapter four is all in lead-based paint. Um, we'll have the ebook done um, probably in the next three weeks, and we'll be sending it to everybody that signed up for it, and then we're going to be revising it. It's getting sent to an editor then to be made permanent, and we'll be sending it again. So anybody that's interested in my ebook, go to baxtergroup.com baxtergroupinc.com don't forget the inc.com and you can sign up for my ebook on the website all right well good 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 deal thanks a lot um so what we'll be doing jocelyn i'm going to be in touch with you in the next 12 to 24 hours um if you're available in the morning uh, we, we can talk about that um off offline but um just to go over the details because you you put a lot of um of information and suggested that you had some information and, and I'm looking over in the chats and people are saying you know they'd be interested in things like your your ebook so um, uh, you and I'll get together and we'll we'll figure out what we can put on the on the website or how much of it we'll just uh, send people to your to your website and we'll, we'll have that conversation offline um, sure thing. you put your email address out there if anybody wants to capture that go ahead and capture that I think Sean put it over there in the in the chat uh, so at this point, what I'd like to do um, is going to be to um, uh, send the the um, uh, uh, the next um, text sign in um, sign in text. Sounds like it just went, and um, the sign out now is air. And what we're going to do is we're Sean is not going to at this point help you out the way he did with the check-in. Um, we are going to uh, check people out, sign people out now. Uh, the sign out token is air, fresh air, get it? And um, uh, and we will send it again if um, uh, in another 10 or 15 minutes, and we will send it again in the morning. So if you do not, have your certificate by tomorrow morning, please send an email to info at cyberashy.org. Info at cyberashy.org if you don't have it by, by tomorrow morning. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be sending it out again this evening. We'll send it out in the morning. And um, so anyone who had trouble, if you didn't didn't get it right away, if you can just send us an email and uh, and explain to us when you did get it, okay? Uh, if you haven't had any troubles tonight, uh, we're trying to work the bugs out of this thing. So in, insight into uh, what your experience was. If you got it right away, if you got it both times right away, uh, that's good. You know, just you're done. Uh, but if you had any problems, like Sean had to sign you in in the beginning, if if you if you, if Sean was able to solve the problem for you, like he, we had your wrong phone number, then you know don't waste our time with with that information. But if you some for some reason you're not getting these text messages. Uh, let us know, and certainly if you did not get the certificate by tomorrow morning, send us an email and we'll make sure you get that. So do we have any, um, uh, oh, we do have a little bit more business, and that is the next one is mark your calendar for January 21, uh, January 1, 2020, and um, I realize that we are not going to uh, have a meeting on New Year's Day. But so so um, mark that off your calendar. We're going to take a month off. We've been doing this for over three years now. We've only missed one week, and that was because of a holiday. So we're going to take off another holiday, and we will be back in February. Uh, so uh, no no meeting, no January, no January meeting. Um, so without further ado, we're going to. Um, uh, unless anybody has any questions or comments about um, uh, what uh, Jocelyn had so far, we're going to end this um, phase of the meeting and we will reconvene in about two minutes.
uh, for the meeting after the meeting. So anybody who wants to participate in helping us improve what we're doing, comments, if you have comments or questions, you want to hang around, um, just hang here and uh, in about two minutes we will reconvene the meeting after the meeting. So thank you. We're, we're all going to try to meet up at IW, so, so attend the meeting after the meeting if you want to, if you're going to IW and you want to meet up. Yeah, good point, good point. So, Sean, I'm looking at the um, – we got this sorted. So it looks like we had um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people who registered but did not show, right? So those people really don't have much to do here. We've got um, one, two, three, four – five, six, who um, signed in but did not sign out. Are those the same people that you had trouble, that had trouble signing in? Sean, are you there? Yes. Um, except Rupal. So we're the same people who were unable to sign in were also unable to sign out as a, as a general Except rule. One. Except one, but yes. Okay, as a general rule. Um, and, you, and, you, and you communicated with those people? Uh, I, I sent an email or I sent a text message to the order from the app, go to meeting. Um, but I didn't hear back from these guys. Yeah, which suggests in, in large measure that it's user error more than it is system error if they couldn't reply to a, t to a chat message. Uh, we know who Jeff Adler is, right? So that's – he's Yeah, his, he's, he doesn't have a smartphone. Right. And that could be what's going on. Okay, so, I, so uh, I'm, I'm going to contact each of these people individually. Don't, don't sign them out. Don't, don't okay. sign them out. Uh, I'm going to contact each one of them individually and um, – uh, find and, and and find out what what the problem was that they had. It could be as simple as they didn't understand it. Some of them may have a dumb phone. Um, some of them may not care. Um, but I want to get to the bottom of this. Is your sense we had a lot had more success with this one than yes. in the past? Yeah. When so I we, said eight, there were actually only six, and one of them one of them was like, "Yeah, I got it and signed in." And I looked at the timestamp on his thing, and I, I was like, well, I'm pretty sure I had to do it. And he was in the same group with the same timestamp as three of the other people I signed out all in the group, you know, sign out thing or sign in thing. 
but he said he got the stuff. So the, really, there were only five. 